Welcome to the Plen Air Podcast from Plen Air Magazine. I'm your host, Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plen Air Magazine. This is episode number two. Last week for our first podcast, we had 1,236 listeners. That's not bad for a first time out of the box. In the Plen Air Podcast, we delve into the world of outdoor painting, often called Plen Air painting. For those who don't know, Plein air in French essentially means outdoors. The French pronounce it plein air, others pronounce it plain air. But no matter what you call it, there is a huge movement of artists around the world who are going outdoors together to paint. And this show is all about the movement, the painters, the collectors, the galleries, and the art. Today we're going to be interviewing legendary art historian Jean Stern, who is executive director of the Irvine Museum. And... We'll get to that in just a minute. He has some great advice for artists and collectors. This podcast is brought to you by the Plen Air Salon, a bi-monthly art competition, which offers $21,000 in annual cash prizes, including fifteen dollars for the grand prize winner, and they get the cover of Plen Air magazine. Bi-monthly winners also win features in the Plen Air Today newsletter. Enter your best studio or Plen Air paintings in several categories, from best plein air piece, best landscape, figure and landscape, nocturne painting, and several others. And you'll be discovered by prominent art gallery professionals who judge the competition and inevitably discover some artists that they didn't previously know, which can't hurt. The entry deadline for this bi-monthly competition is January 31st, so enter soon. Visit pleinairsalon.com. It is my personal goal to see more people fall in love with plein air painting for so many reasons. It's such a wonderful thing to do. It opens your eyes to the world. So I hope you'll share this podcast with your friends on social media or email. And of course, I hope you'll subscribe so it comes automatically to you each week. And if you have feedback or interview requests, you can reach me, eric at plenairmagazine.com. I also want to remind everybody that Valentine's Day is the last day to register for the Plein Air Convention, assuming seats are left by then, and get the early bird price. That saves you $200. This year we're meeting in Tucson, and it is the world's largest gathering of Plein Air painters, with five days of instruction by a faculty of over 60 of the world's top painters. And we intend to once again break the world's record for the most number of people painting in one place simultaneously. This year, it could be 900 to 1,000 people. And I think we could potentially sell out before we get to Valentine's Day because we are way ahead of last year. You can learn more at plenairconvention.com. It's hard to think about plein air painting or plein air collecting without thinking of Jean Stern. He's an art historian, curator, writer, author of several books and artist monographs, and one of the most sought-after plein air judges at events He helps collectors with their collections, he helps museums, and he's a recipient of Plein Air Magazine's Lifetime Achievement Award. Let's get right to this interview. John, welcome. Thank you, Eric. It's a pleasure to do this with you. Well, it's nice to have you on on board here. I understand that you've you've not been feeling well the past couple of weeks, so I'm glad that uh, you were able to do this today. No, I'm I'm happy you called, and, and the timing's just right, so... Uh, let's do something great together here. Okay. Well, what would that be? <laughs> uh, talk about something meaningful. All right. Well, uh, teach teach something something to uh, to whoever's listening. Uh, well, give them something to to look for to to enjoy and maybe to to answer a question or two. Um, I'm really interested in your opinions about the current plein air movement because uh, you have documented the days of the past and the plein air movements of the past. And, and I'm, I'm curious to get your thoughts about what you think is going on now and how you feel about it. Well, you know, I, I was raised in a family of an art dealer. Uh, my father, Fred Stern, had an art gallery in Los Angeles that specialized in French 19th century paintings and sculpture. And my brothers, Louis and George and I, we were kind of like the 
drafted. Uh, anytime we're available, you just come and work for Dad and, you know, do something and learn something. So we all grew up in, in art, and, and we all are still in, in the art. Um, but um, my, my father instilled on us an appreciation of, of craftsmanship, of quality, and, um, you know, it, it stuck with me. I, I, for years, um, I collected historic paintings, um, the, the artists I loving, lovingly call the dead ones. And um, I got into California art about 1975 as a graduate student uh, here in San Diego State. Uh, noticed that there were a lot of paintings in, in junk shops, beautiful paintings that, that nobody knew anything about. The artists were unknown. There were no books or nothing available. So my wife at the time, Carol and I, uh, began collecting these things. And and um, it turned out that um, there there are some good artists that are just unknown. Either they, they, they lived, they had a great life, they painted beautiful things, they never got discovered, and, and, and they went off into obscurity. And 50 years later, some, some graduate student guy uh, comes in and says, God, that's a beautiful painting, and how come it's so cheap, and buys it. And and eventually, I, I was interested in trying to find out who these artists were. And, and um, uh, eventually, a book came out in 1975 by Nancy Murray that, that listed the artists of, of Southern California. And it became a wonderful thing because you could finally look up these artists. And I, in 1978, I was hired by Peterson, uh, by Bob Peterson in Beverly Hills to help run his gallery. Uh, which uh, years later uh, became the the number one U.S. specialist in California impressionism. But but we started out by by doing by buying art that was underpriced, essentially beautiful art that nobody knew anything about. And I did that for years and and built up a pretty good little collection of of the dead guys. And um, then sometime about 1992, uh, I was looking at some exhibit in Laguna Beach and run, ran across the work of, uh, among others, of Ken Oster. And I thought, my God, these guys are good, and, and who are they? And, and they're not dead. Uh, they're alive, and they're painting. So uh, I began looking at these things. I began, uh, I joined the California Art Club in, in 1993 as a patron, not as a painter. And I was hired uh, at the same time by Joan Irvine Smith, to help her start the Irvine Museum. And I realized that there, we are in a time where there are a lot of good contemporary artists, and I was determined to start collecting the work of these people. And I got to know them. I went to California Art Club meetings. I went to exhibitions. I did lectures. I, I talked to a lot of artists, and I began buying uh, these paintings. And, and today... Um, Thirty years later, my my collection at home is is mostly uh, living artists, artists that are friends of of ours, artists that have been to our house and or we've been to their house, have had dinner with them, socialize with their family, and and it's a, a thriving community right now. I, I think of it as another renaissance of landscape painting, and it's happening mostly in Southern California, but it turns out it's also happening all over the country. And then I, you know, years ago I ran across your magazine, um, and um, I wrote an article, I think it's in the very first issue of Plein Air magazine, and uh, it, it became the instrument for for understanding what was happening in the in the world of contemporary landscape painting, I'll uh, I'll send you the money uh, later for saying that. Thank <laughs> no, you. <clears throat> you you've done a lot for me already, but but it it really opened my eyes because I had thought that you know this type of art was dead, it was in the past, and that nobody was painting nature, nobody was interested in beautiful light and 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 enriching scenery. And I was wrong. Um, there, there are some wonderful painters out there, and I've gone out of my way to. I've attended every plein air conference. This will be the fifth one uh, convention for me. I've attended other groups. I've judged probably 75 art shows 
I've lectured over 250 times in in places all over the country, and I made a point that I was going to know these people, uh, that I was going to be there with them, and I was going to brag that I knew them when, um, when they were just starting out. And, and many of these artists now are, are getting national recognition, um, more for what you've done with your magazine than I've done with my my museum here, but it, it doesn't matter. Good art will come out, and people will see it, and it has always been my firm belief that if people see this type of beautiful art, either from the present or the past, that they will like it, and, and I have not been disappointed. So there are artists who come from that um, early stage era when you first discovered Ken Oster and others um, who are looking at this movement today as um, maybe not a good thing. And one of the things that they're concerned about, uh, at least I, I can't say as a blanket, but there are some, and they're concerned about that, um, you know, when they were doing this, there were literally no shows. And then uh, a while later, there were a couple of shows, like the Plein Air Painters of America show, which was a fabulous success in um, Catalina Island. Yeah. Yeah. A- and now today... I couldn't tell you how many shows there are, but we hear from most of them. I'll bet there are a couple of hundred shows uh, from every every small community to every big community to every fundraiser. This is a hot topic. This is something people are into. Uh, collectors are traveling uh, all over to these shows, but their concern is that perhaps um, the quality is not as high as it should be because there's so many shows that there are not enough quality artists to go around. That's not my statement. I don't necessarily believe that, but I'd be curious what you think. Well, I think, I think there's some merit to that belief that uh, as things catch on, you draw a much larger audience. And because of that, you dilute the pot to some extent. Um, But Whenever I go anywhere, Eric, and I, I do a lecture or a judging, I come away with at least one artist that I'd never heard of before that is truly good and possibly great. I meet maybe 20 or 25 that I probably will, you know, wouldn't particularly mind if I never saw them again. But um, <laughs> yeah, would you like to give us a list of those people right now and ru- ruin my career and yours? <laughs> <laughs> no, they know who they are, but uh, uh, I think it's 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 inevitable that the the greater something becomes with with popularity, that it does get diluted. But it's also inevitable that the the good paintings will come out, the cream will rise, the artists that that are worthy of of being recognized will be recognized. I think the marketplace has its own way of dealing with things like that. Um, and as I say, I, um, I meet a lot of artists. I, I meet a lot of artists. When I first started working at, at Peterson Galleries, this was in 1978, a young man came in from Utah who was looking for representation. And um, we did not deal with living artists in, at Peterson. We dealt with historic paintings. But right across the street on Rodeo Drive was my brother Louis who was the director at the time of Wally Finley Galleries. And this this young man comes in, shows me slides and some paintings. His name is Gregory Hull. And I didn't know him from anybody, but I immediately knew this guy was good. And and, uh, we called over and and arranged to have Louis talk to him and look at his art, and and they immediately signed him to a contract. Uh, Greg, this was in 1978, Greg couldn't give away. He could not give away a painting. And um, I, I had my portrait done by him uh, way back then in 1978. A couple of portraits, a portrait of my wife, even did portraits of my kids. Uh, we became very close friends, and we saw each other a lot. And now um, he is a recognized artist. And, and it isn't because of anything I've done. It's because um, people get the chance to look at, at the paintings, and, and they will make the judgment. The quality will be determined by 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 the audience it's it's almost like you know adam smith supply and demand 
and and you know, the the good artists will rise. There are artists um, that that um, I absolutely did not know Brian Mark Taylor when I first ran into his work. I had no idea who he was, and he looked like a twelve year old kid. He still does, <laughs> but uh, it's amazing what a quality painter he is. And every time I go to the conventions, I run into artists I've never really considered or haven't even heard of, and and these artists are consistently winning awards. So, no, I don't know. I mean, you know, yeah, you're going to get a lot of people that get into this thing, and you're going to get a lot of of, of people that never succeed. Um, Well, and it's not necessarily about success either. You know, everybody's in it for a different purpose. Some some are in it to be, you know, um, a professional artist and well-known, and others yeah. are doing it because they enjoy the process and the, the social aspects and the travel and, and just, you know, painting uh, as, as a hobby. But what's no, interesting I, to me is that I, I'm watching careers of, of people who I did not think were very accomplished painters when I first started watching them, but yet... You look at how they're developing now and, and what has happened two, three, four, five years later by constant painting, and, and th- there's a huge number of people that are really upping their game and, and moving into a, another level as a result of just being out there. No, you're absolutely right. And, and uh, a good reason for that is that they are growing. They are learning their craft. You have to learn your craft before you can practice your art. If you don't know how to use the tools of, of your art, you're never going to be able to express yourself. You're never going to get the full value of whatever genius is inside of you. It, it will never come out because there's no method to get it out unless you perfect your craft and know what, what to do with the tools that are in front of you. And, and some artists are always learning and and they they will get better that's the hope and some artists go on personality or they go on on some other aspect that they have and they feel they really don't need to learn uh, more than they already know and uh, maybe they'll be successful maybe not um financial success economic success is is not a good indicator of artistic capability there are a lot of crappy artists that have made a lot of money, and there are a lot of great artists that have not made any money. Uh, it, it, it's, it's two different things. You cannot judge artistic quality by the value, the dollar value that somebody puts on a work of art and whether or not it sells. Well, and some would say that um, just by being in the, in the commercial world, if you will, and selling your paintings, uh, can potentially influence what you're painting and how you're painting because the temptation is there to paint for the, the gallery or paint for the audience. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and a good case of point is Greg Hull because his, his uh, first uh, approach to art was these gorgeous still lifes, beautiful still lifes with, with the silver plate effect on the bowls and the fruit, and they were, they were wonderful. And he he was represented by Wally Finley for years. They sold hundreds and hundreds of these, and he got so sick and tired of painting them that he he literally said, I want out. And he hasn't painted in still life. He hasn't painted a still life in maybe 15, 20 years. So go figure. So what what is your advice to, to artists who are looking to raise the bar in quality and looking to make a... Um, a career as an artist, but making sure that quality comes first? Well, my advice is to develop your craft. Find an artist that you think is great and learn from them. Uh, take workshops, uh, buy the DVDs, buy the books, uh, go there and paint with them and, and learn it to do what it is they do and apply it to your vision. Uh, I think you you need to constantly get better. Uh, there there is no profession in the world that that improves without practice. You have to keep practicing. You have to learn to do what it is you're trying to do and to do it better. And and education is is still the most important thing you can do as an artist. Oh, I think that's very good advice. 
What do you think the biggest mistakes that you see being made by artists are today? Well, I think a, a lot of artists um, refuse to to wait and and to play the game and to get the education and to get into the exhibitions and to work their way up. I think a lot of artists are looking for for shortcuts. Um, they they want to associate with with other important artists and. They thrust themselves into the spotlight, and they're not they're not ready. So, but again, this this is this is applying a a um, a yardstick that measures success by financial sales, by 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 money. Um, right. Well, there's something very validating when you know somebody has paid money because they love your work. Well, yeah, that's that's the way we're all brought up. It's the American way. Uh, <laughs> if you're if you're good, you're gonna you're gonna rise to the top. You're gonna make a lot of money. You're gonna drive a big car, you know. But um, you know, I I I think the true artists, the artists that that really um, achieve greatness, may may never really find that financial success. But they, they're the artists that, that insist on, on growing, on doing things. Uh, artists are afraid of making mistakes. Uh, artists are often changing styles. Uh, there's a lot of things that happen. And, and who's to tell you, you you should do that or you should not do that? Um, you know, I come from a family of art dealers. And the art dealers uh, want an artist that, that stays frozen in time that keeps painting the same thing over and over again and and they can sell it over and over again and and an artist will not do that and they should not do that an artist should say well i don't paint like that anymore and and i'm painting something else and and I'm, i want to grow i want to be better uh, sometimes they grow in the wrong direction um, sometimes they they succeed I, it's it's a difficult life and you need the validation of others to get the financial um, rewards that come from from selling your work. And uh, a lot of times, people are not the best judge of, of what an artist is is doing. Um, God knows there are a lot of artists that have merchandised a famous name into some sort of financial success, but they're they're never going to be an artist. They're never going to be great artists, so you know so, it, it's not easy. If I if I knew the answer, Eric, I'd be I'd be over there with a with an easel and you know and a paintbrush and 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 doing it myself. <laughs> I can't. You know, I decided long ago that I I could not know how to paint, but I was going to know why. Why do people paint? And I still don't know. It, it's it's a mystery to me, but but. I've got a better grasp of it than than I think most people have because because I've seen so many paintings and I've met so many artists. Um, it, it it has to have an effect. You you know you, you've got to be able to tell a bad painting from a good painting, and even what I just said, you're going to get people howling. You know what does he mean a bad painting and why why what does he mean a good painting and who's to say he's the judge? So. Well, yeah, I mean, it's an old debate, and uh, it's an old debate that goes back to, in the art industry, we're one of the few industries that has no standards. Uh, I think we do on our side of things. Um, certainly the representational side of things has standards that one can judge quality to some extent. On the contemporary side, that that I suppose is debatable, right? In In music, at least, we have a scale and a... And a keyboard in art, um, contemporary, it's a whole other thing. But I don't think I'll open that door because we'll, yeah, get, let's, let's not go there. we'll, we'll get a we'll lot get of letters trouble. on that. But the, yeah. So the, the issue for an artist is, you know, how do you know when you're cooked? How do you know when you're ready? How do you know when it's time for you to go out to market? Um, you know, you show your paintings to your family members and they all tell you they're wonderful. Yeah. Or in the case of some members, not. And, um, 
you know, the galleries are getting lots and lots of submissions. I know one guy who told me he gets about 65 submissions a month from, from artists and, and doesn't even open them. Um, how does one know? How do, how do you get a feel for when you're ready? Well, it's, it's a good question, and, and I want to come back to this idea of, of knowing how to use your tools. Um, a painter, one that does paintings of nature, a representational painter, uh, has to learn certain basic things. They have to learn how to draw, because if you can't represent what it is you're trying to represent, it, you, it's not going to work. You have to learn how to draw. If you're going to paint a tree, you've got to start by drawing a tree and, and so on. Then you've got to have the proper coloring. You have to have color that, that is accurate, that's natural. And, uh, and then you can go beyond that and, and create colors that, that are, you know, more than natural, that actually move, that, that appear to move. That, that, uh, and then you need, you need to be able to represent three-dimensional space. You have to learn perspective. And there, there's all these basic things that they teach you or they should be teaching you in art school, and many art schools don't teach you that anymore. They won't even teach you how to draw anymore. But um, assuming you've mastered those basic skills, then then you just need to to um, paint and paint and paint and paint and, and get them all out. You know the old saying: there there are ten thousand bad paintings inside each of us, and the quicker quicker we get them out, the better we'll be. <laughs> but there does come a time, like you said, that when when is it time to go talk to the dealer? When is it a good time to go to go sell it to somebody you don't know, somebody who isn't related to you? And and there is no such yardstick. You just you just try it and see. And if it works, it works. And you know, but but you as an artist, I think, should be concerned with constantly refining your skills. Nobody likes to work on skills because this is supposed to be an art, and you're supposed to be born with this art. Well, you may be born with the art inside of you, but you can't get it out unless you master the tools that you chose to work with. And and some of those tools, the people have, you know, they take years to master. And there, there is no substitute in my mind for repetitious growth, for doing something over and over again, and you get better at it, and, and it becomes easier and easier to do. You know, I think that um, many artists today are suffering um, what I would call shiny object syndrome. Um, it's so easy to be distracted as an artist today and to find other things that you tell yourself are, are good for your career. Um, and, and sometimes they are, so that's always the delicate balance. But, um, you know, there uh, artists need to make livings, uh, especially those who are out on their own. And so they're focusing on a lot of other things rather than focusing on their paintings. And, uh, you know, it, it may be teaching. And, of course, we learn from teaching. So teaching's not so bad. But when it comes down to, um, you know, the, people are creating all kinds of other things, they're not necessarily bad things, but they're, they could be distractions. Um, I know one painter friend who will go unnamed who's spending all of his time, for instance, creating videos, um, and he's making good money off the videos, but he's not painting. And yeah. he's spending more time running his video business than he is, is painting and is now feeling a little stuck. It's like, okay, how do I get back to it? You know, I'm used to this revenue, but if I stop, it's going to stop. you have any yeah. thoughts on the distractions? No, I, I, I don't. I'm, I'm not an artist. I, I can't give you the firsthand feeling of having to survive by, by being a painter. Um, I'm, I'm an art historian. Uh, I'm supposed to know a good painting when I see one. I'm supposed to know why. But I, I don't know. The, the, the test is still in my mind that if People will see it, and if they want it, then then you're succeeding. Um, it's still a you know it's still tinged by that that commercialism of the art dealer that that if it's good it'll sell, and and that's a fallacy in itself. But 
in real life, you, you either are born rich and you don't need to worry about selling your paintings, or you have to sell your paintings to, to be an artist, or you have to have a, another job to support you as an artist, or you have to have a spouse that supports you, supports you as an artist. So it, it's, it's, it's a very difficult, very difficult way to earn a living. Um, but, you know, for, for somebody like you talked about that, that's done very well with, with videos, um, they should just, you know, get into an exhibition, join an art club, which I'm sure they're members of. Uh, a lot of young artists ask me, and they say, I, you know, I think I'm ready now. What do I do? I said, well, you've got to get, you gotta get it so people can look at your art. So join several art clubs. Get into their exhibitions. Uh, you know, participate. Get your art out there. And, and people have to see it. These competitions are really good for that because um, uh, we, we've seen a lot of artists who get discovered, if you will, because they enter, even though they're, they're up against some of the big players, oftentimes will win or win significant positions in these things, and all of a sudden they're getting noticed. Well, they, it wouldn't have happened unless they were out there to be seen. So you, you've got to take the dip sometime. Uh, you've got to get out there. Uh, you, you've got to get people to look at your art and, and to make some sort of a judgment. And then you go on from there. So, Jean, um, when I first started falling in love with art, uh, the thing I look back on the things that I was in love with now, and I'm almost embarrassed. I, I, I remember... A, fantasy art poster that I I paid, I don't know, $75 for or something. And uh, and now I look back on that and I, you know, I was a teenager, of course. But um, your taste develops and changes over time. Yeah. Uh, and, and I've watched my taste develop and change over time, both as a painter, but also as a collector. How does, um, how does a collector know if they're collecting something that's good or does that matter is it is it just about does this painting speak to me or does it go beyond that well you know i have this discussion a lot um uh, for many years i've advised collectors and, and helped build collections and uh, i went through the same thing um I, i'll bet you eric that you and i have this in common that we still own the very first work of art we bought but we don't own the next 72 of them, that we got rid of those. But we keep the first one. <laughs> and the, the hardest lessons are the ones that cost you the most. And I still have the very first painting I ever bought. It, it's hanging in my house. It's, it's a beautiful painting, but I don't know that I would own another one like it now. Yeah. And, and, and I, I, my tastes have changed. And for, for collectors, um, you as a collector, need to start experiencing what, what your tastes are and start quantifying your tastes. And, and to do that is, yeah, uh, buy something you like. Live with it. Enjoy it. And, and if, if you end up not liking it, that's a good sign. It means your tastes have grown. Your, your, your tastes have changed. So um, for a lot of collectors that want to collect historic paintings, uh, I tell them the best way to determine a good painting is to learn what a bad painting looks like. And, and to do that, I tell them go to an auction. Because at an auction, about 90% of the material will be, will be things that cannot sell on the open market because there's something wrong. Uh, either they're badly painted or there's damage or there's something going on or there are forgeries. All those things you're going to need to need to learn. You, you know, I I, I got to tell you, I, I've been in the art business now for almost 20 years, and I've never heard that. Well, that's, that's fascinating. I never really stopped to think about that. No, you you cannot learn what something that what good is until you learn what bad is, and and you need to look at mistakes so that you can spot them in the future, and you can say. Uh, I don't need to, you know, do that all over again. I did it five years ago when I bought this painting. So that's that's one thing when when it's an historic market when the, they're they're you know the the artists are dead. But with living artists, um, 
you don't have to worry about forgeries. You don't have to worry about, you know, generally damaged or or something that went wrong because you just got it from fresh from the artist. Um, what what will happen with living artists is is your tastes will change, and then the artist's tastes will change. And and if you buy a painting from a young artist, um, thirty years from now. The market will say, wow, this is a great famous artist, but the painting you bought 30 years ago doesn't look like what he's doing now. Yeah. And there'll be doubts. Are you sure that's by this artist? So it's just part of, you know, experience in life. And, and you grow with it, and you learn from your mistakes, um, and uh, you get better at it. A collector needs to grow just as much as an artist. A collector needs to get better. They need to develop their eye to be able to, to recognize problems uh, or mistakes. You know, how do you know when a drawing is bad? How do you know when the perspective is bad? Uh, how do you know when, when you know, the colors are bad? You, 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 there's no book. There's no guideline. You just have to grow into it, and you just have to develop uh, your eyes. So I always advise collectors to go to art shows, and look at art, and look, look, look before you buy. And don't rush into anything. Um, just make sure you develop your tastes and you develop your eyes. And, and um, they still make mistakes. So. Yeah. Well, it's easy to get caught up in. I, I have a friend out your way who has a huge collection, a, a multi-million dollar collection of paintings that today are virtually worthless because he got caught up in one particular artist and, and that artist was hot for a minute and he, he was, he had plenty of money and he invested in that artist and boom. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's all over now. And, and it's sad because, you know, he's, they still hang on his wall, but he doesn't even like him anymore. Well, that's, that's the risk you take. I, I think when you collect, you should collect with the idea that you're going to keep them your whole life. And that it's your kids that are going to make money when they sell it after they inherit it. Because most collectors I know, serious collectors, they're not dealers. They buy something and they keep it. They live with it. It becomes part of who they are. It becomes part of their home. And, and they end up having the enjoyment of this work all their life. If, if you're in it to make money, then you might as well open up a dealership and, and become an art dealer. And then because, pour large quantities of money into the ground. And, and, and then 24 hours a day, you got to stay on top of the market. Yeah. And you got to talk to everybody. You got to meet everybody. You know, you, you can't out dealer the dealer. Um, you, you've got to be who you are. And, and the dealer is in it for a completely different reason. Well, that goes to the dealer now. Let's, let's transition there for just a second. Uh, there are many artists who now believe that the dealer is no longer necessary. Um, a lot of artists are selling direct, selling online. Some are doing both. Um, my, my sense is that if you can find a trusted advisor who knows and understands art, there's a lot of value in that uh, as a collector. And from the perspective of an artist, if you can find somebody who's selling your work while you're sleeping, and doing, you know, doing a lot of that work for you, then you can focus and concentrate on your art. What are your thoughts? Well, you know, um, there's some guy doing a marketing boot camp around. Uh, <laughs> Watch it. <laughs> no, my, my feeling is I'm, I'm, I'm going to wait and see. Because if you'd asked me this um, 20 years ago, I would have said ridiculous. I said, your dealer does a lot more for you than sell your paintings. A good dealer will um, run ads. They will do occasional shows, catalogs, uh, maybe a book. They will establish a provenance so that 50 years from now, somebody goes looking for you, they'll be able to find a trail. But if you do it all by yourself and you're on the Internet and you don't have anybody doing any ads or any catalogs or any books, uh, when you die, nobody will find you. Right. So, well, and especially it, because of digital, digital in, in its current form may disappear. You know, most yeah. of us don't even have photographs anymore. Yeah, because as, as an art historian, if I want to look up an artist, 
I go to various sources that generally record exhibition material, where they showed something and when, and how big was it and what did it sell for. And there's exhibition records, there's dealer records, there's advertisers. But that's changing. That's changing. And um, I'm going to wait and see. I'm, I'm, my advice is to have, you know, both a, a, a dealer that you can trust, which, which is saying a big thing, and then also to do a lot of the, the work yourself and to do some of that, but not to bank on, on 100%, not, not yet, because right. if, if it does all disappear when you disappear, then you will not have existed. Yeah. So as an art historian, um, let's flip back to being a painter for just a second. You, um, you find a piece, went back in the, in the 70s when we, you were finding pieces of art in flea markets that were fabulous pieces and an artist that you've never heard of and you can't find anything about them. Um, What do you wish that artist would have done related to that particular painting? And what recommendation would you give to an artist today related to the paintings they're producing? Well, one of the things that really bugged me to this day is you know people and I know people that when they sign their name on a painting, only they and their mother could read it. <laughs> and how the hell are you going to know who painted it? <laughs> so I wish they would have a nice, clear signature, and on the front, a date would always be nice, and uh, a label on the back, maybe with a little biography on the back. And, and you find that occasionally. My As, as an art dealer... As an art historian, I I get as much information from looking at the back of the painting as I do from the front of the painting, because the back of the painting records where that painting has been, and and you can trace things. You can if 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 I see on the back of a painting that somebody's removed the previous label, I get mad, I get very angry because it's probably some idiot dealer. That did want did not want the label of another dealer on the painting he's trying to sell. Probably a price tag. It could be a price tag too. Right. You know, and and somebody scratched off the price tag or put a one in front of it, or put a zero at the other end. It, it's it's all you know silly stuff. Yeah. But I would love to be able to identify that artist from the front and from the back. So my my advice to a lot of artists, and I am not shy about giving it to people that I know is if, if you don't sign it so it can be read, you're not going to be recognized. The whole point of signing your painting is to be recognized. So why would you sign it in such a way that nobody can read it? So you know, thank you for I, asking me that. That's been yeah, bugging me a long time. Yeah, I, I, I'd take it even a step further. One of the things that I do, um, I take every plein air study that I do, and I write the story of where I was, I take usually do it in a Sharpie, may not be very pretty. I, yeah. I, I, first off, I write out my name, I do my signature, I put my copyright on it, but I also say, you know, I painted this on the corner of, you know, XYZ and XYZ on this date, you know, in whatever town. Uh, and, and if there's someone with me, I'll say, you know, Ken Oster was painting with me that day, because maybe someday that other painting that Ken Oster did side by side with me would show up and wouldn't that be interesting? So well, I see, try to put the stories and the information on there. And what's fabulous for me is that, you know, I now look back on my collection of things that I've done and, and I can be reminded of what, what was that place? Where was it? Oh, yeah, now I know. I can go back and paint it again. Yeah. Well, you're, you're very unusual and... and you you will be blessed in the in the future world for that because <laughs> it will make life a lot easier for for everybody not to mention your heirs who are going to inherit all this stuff but there are there are artists that that do that and and we love it anna hills um one of the laguna beach painters here she used she writes a whole bunch of stuff on the back and and it is very helpful and and it's it's reassuring to see that because you know you're looking at a real Anna Hills uh, because there's as much as I say there's as much information that can be gleaned 
from the back of the painting as, as there is from the front. One thing I'd like to see as well, I'm not doing it, um, and it's not easy to access, um, at least I don't think it is in my smartphone, but I'd actually like to write down the GPS location. Because look at how many paintings over the years we've tried to figure out, where did they paint that? You know, and, and wouldn't right. that be nice with today's technology to be able to go back to the exact spot? No, you're right, because I, I attended a lecture once on, on the paintings of Edgar Payne, and there was this, this um, character, a pseudo-art historian, who claimed that almost all of them were, were somewhat heavily made up and changed things and liked to move around. And, and it turned out to be wrong, because other people have gone up to the same exact places where Edgar painted, took photographs, and it turns out to be they're actually right. that they, He painted every peak just where it should be, and and that would that would eliminate a lot of that trying to figure out where it was painted, um, you know, and 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 if you know where it was painted, you can maybe establish what date it was done and what trip he was on, uh, or was she painting with this other person? All these things, you know, they they don't mean a thing now, but 50 years from now, 100 years from now, if that artist is is of merit, and they're going to be researched by some some poor little art historian just out of graduate school that's going to make their life a, life a lot easier, especially since there won't be any books anymore or there won't be any any articles anymore because everything will be on the Internet. And, and it's, it's, you know, do what you can now to, to make an art historian's life easier in the future and you'll be rewarded. Well, and perhaps paintings will become more revered, hopefully, as we we paint places like uh, Crystal Cove or or places that are potentially going to be extinct in the future, yeah. um, perhaps that you know if we continue that that practice of preserving the past or the present, you know, I'm taking a group of a hundred painters to Cuba with me, and we're going to paint Cuba as it is today, right before all the new condos get built and and yep. everything changes. Yeah. Exactly, exactly, and and that needs to be documented, uh, not just by the work of art, but on the work of art. Absolutely. Well, Jean, uh, I, I really appreciate your time today, and I think we could probably do a three or four or five part series because there's so much knowledge, and and I will have you back. Um, you're a wealth of information, and you are also such a wonderful supporter of the world of landscape painting and plein air painting and and of course you've been so wonderful to plein air magazine and the convention and all the things that that we do i i just think that we owe you a, a huge amount of gratitude and um i know we honored you at the convention a couple of years ago and yes, but there's just did. not enough that we could do for you you're just a, a superstar in our world well I, i'm going to say the same exact thing about you eric so oh, back you're, at you. <laughs> you're responsible for a lot of the wonderful things that are happening right now. Well, somebody's got to do it, right? <laughs> well, and you can have fun doing it, too. Oh, it's a ball. It's a blast. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. Okay, Eric. Anytime. Well, that was awesome. John Stern is going to be joining us on stage at this year's Plein Air Convention, helping me with a special Lifetime Achievement Award for artist Ken Oster. We also have a Lifetime Achievement Award for the amazing watercolor legend, superstar Dean Mitchell. Not to be missed, this plein air convention. Well, this podcast, episode number two, comes to an end. Brought to you by Plein Air Magazine's Plein Air Convention. Remember, pleinairconvention.com. Early bird pricing ends the 14th of February. Also sponsored by Plein Air Salon. Get your entries in by January 31st. We're getting close to the giveaway. $21,000 in cash coming right out of my pocket. And that'll be presented to the winners at the Plein Air Convention. So uh, go to pleinairsalon.com. And I'm very proud to mention once again that Plein Air Magazine is the best-selling art magazine at Barnes & Noble stores nationally across the country. So drop in and pick one up, or better yet, get a subscription for about half that price, just go to plenairmagazine.com. Well, this was fun. Let's do it again sometime, like next week. I'll see you then. I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plein Air Magazine. Remember, it's a big world. Go paint it. I'll see you.
拜。